You are listening to Up Talk with Sean Conahan. The gloves are off, and it's time to have a chat. Hey there, people. Welcome to episode four of the Up Talk podcast. This is a special extra episode of the podcast. I've learned that there are stories out there about mental health that don't necessarily focus on PTSD and first responders that I'd love to tell. So this episode is a sports industry themed episode and our guests are incredible. First we talk to TSN's Michael Landsberg about his story. Next we have Big Daddy Gary Goodrich who is a mixed martial arts, a Canadian mixed martial arts legend and he tells his story of degenerative dementia and CTE. A really good chat with him. And to end things off, I have a chat with Theo Fleury, former NHL All-Star, about his story. So I hope you enjoy it. I'd like to thank my sponsors, Rest Ed Seminars, the Compass Rose Health and Wellness Center, and Dan Sun Photography for helping to support the podcast. You can check out their links on my new website for the podcast That is www.uptalkpodcast.com. On that site, you'll be able to get all the information about UpTalk, including links to all the episodes. And so check that out and let me know what you think. And I think this is how I'll handle issues that are outside of the PTSD first responder realm. I'll just, uh, I'll do an extra podcast. So let me, you know, let me know what you think of that and if that works for you. And as always, just a uh, warning before we start that uh, there are possible triggers in the podcast for any of you that have trigger issues, so just make sure you're in a good headspace and are uh, prepared to listen. Other than that, I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. So without further ado, let's get started. If you are a sports geek like me, my next guest is going to need no introduction. However, I'm going to do it anyway. Starting in 1984 as the anchor of TSN Sports Desk, transitioning in 1997 to his own critically acclaimed uh, talk show, Off the Record, and later becoming an advocate for mental health awareness through initiatives such as Bell Let's Talk and now his own initiative, Hashtag Sick Not Weak. It is with great pleasure that I introduce everybody to Michael Landsberg. How are you doing today, Michael? Hey, you know, I was listening to every word of your introduction just to see if I could spot an error so I could jump in correcting you and people would say, oh, man, he really is a jackass. But <laughs> I didn't hear anything that was uh, except for maybe the acclaimed part. But other than that, uh, I'm great, Sean. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Perfect. And thank you for coming on. Uh, again, a great, great pleasure of mine, great thrill of mine to have you on. Maybe just give our, our listeners a... Maybe just a, a brief history of your own mental health journey. One sec, Sean. <laughs> hey, Brando, do you know who I'm on with? That's right. You he has no idea who I am. Yeah, Sean. It's Sean Conahan. Not Monahan. God. <laughs> he doesn't know any Conahans. You see, that's the thing. That's true. Yeah. Hold on one sec, okay? I'm sorry. Right. About this. My journey probably started when I was... <sighs> I can remember being in grade two, which is, uh, I guess, the first time I was in grade two, I was seven years old. Uh, <laughs> but I remember having fears that I didn't believe anyone else had. And therefore, I never shared them with anyone. So it was impossible for me to be diagnosed with general anxiety disorder or whatever else it would be described as back then. I don't even think that diagnosis existed. Right. So I, I kind of lived as... Uh, as a kid, a very happy life, and I was blessed with amazing parents and an amazing family. And I, I think of my childhood as filled with joy, with the mental health issue probably being a footnote to it. It didn't dominate my life, but it affected my life. Right. I was afraid to do certain things because of these fears I had in my head, and therefore I did not do them. So it's all part of my makeup. So fast forward to, uh, I guess, 1998, say, uh, just after we started off the record, and I fell into what was my first, uh, and sadly not my only bout with severe depression. I was treated, 
And then, like everybody, I went off medication because everybody does it. Then I went back on and back off. And this kind of cycle continued until 2008 when after suffering from severe anxiety because of a health condition with one of my kids, I fell into this horrible hole of depression. I started using Ativan to to find a way to relax. Uh, I started to become addicted to it, so I decided I had to stop. I stopped cold turkey, which multiplied my depression. So I was in real problem, and uh, that was 2008. Uh, fortunately, I live in a time when something called antidepressants exist, and I'm someone who's willing to turn to anything to get better. Yep. So I, I did get better, and here we are today. Since then, I've lived uh, mostly a healthy existence. Uh, although my depression is chronic and I don't believe will ever go away, it's manageable while being treated. Awesome. Was, was there a conversation in, in 1998, was there a conversation with your employer that you had to have? No, no, there wasn't. But I, it was never a secret. Here's the thing, Sean. Right. Uh, I, I didn't talk about it on the air until right. 2009. But I never hit it. People I work with knew my employer would have known if I thought it was important for my employer to know. Right. Uh, my family knew for sure. My friends knew. I just, I just never went to management because, you know, to be honest with you, when I think back to what that was like, I don't think I believed that management could play any role in my illness. I, I, mm. I think, and it's a while ago now, but I think I believe that I just had to suck it up and I just yeah. had to make my way through it. And, and this was right. just shortly after I'd be given this really good chance in my career to have my own television show. Right. So missing a day, missing an hour was never an option for me. And would I have gotten better faster if I would have taken time off? I don't know. Uh, but I didn't. And you, you feel like you had, uh, you had good support from your, Circle of friends and, and family, obviously, throughout, throughout the ones that knew, obviously, you, you had good support for that. Yeah, but one of the reasons why you and I are having this conversation is Sick Not Weak. Right. And Sick Not Weak is really the acknowledgement that unless people have suffered from this illness that you're suffering from, there will always be a barrier up between you and them. Right. That they will never understand you and therefore you can never be comforted and their sympathy will never really be as beneficial as it would be if they did understand you. Because at its heart, especially with depression and anxiety and bipolar, with all of them, right. at its heart, this illness is impossible to understand. Because fundamentally, as human beings, we believe that something joyous happening will bring us joy. Yeah. And when, when you say, I don't, I don't care what happens to me today. Because I won't feel any joy. People don't understand that. So then they start to do things like, hey, you know what, Michael, I know you're struggling. I know you're a little sad. So why don't we go to a movie? Yeah, and, yeah. and, and while that's sympathetic and, and there's nothing wrong with that, it's it's an absolute. <laughs> it, it, if you've been in that position, it, it's ridiculous. It is, but that's yeah. what people do who are motivated by love and caring. They say things like that. So even though I had all kinds of support, I didn't have anyone that I could talk to who could could say, yeah, you know what, Michael, I've been there before. Because when you hear those words, mm. when you hear someone say, I know exactly what you're feeling, and then they talk about what they felt and it matches up with what you felt, now you're not alone. Exactly. No, that's absolutely right. And I, I've sort of experienced the same the same thing. And then you, when was it that you got involved with Bell Let's Talk? You know, I, it was it was weird because for me, 2009 was was the uh, was the time when I, I started sharing, and it just happened by coincidence. I interviewed someone who had suffered from depression. I thought, man, it'd be a good question. I'll throw it out there and I'll ask them how they're doing, and I'll say I too have suffered, never thinking that it would change my life, but it did because right. of the reaction that I received. So here I am in 2009. Um, I began to, and this was late 2009, so in 2010, I began to speak publicly about my own struggles with mental health, the ones we were talking about right now. And I found this this crazy reaction, this crazy benefit to it, where people would go, oh my gosh, hearing you say that without embarrassment or shame makes me feel stronger. It makes me feel like I can reach out and I can share and I can go for help. So I, 
realized at that point that there was a huge benefit, not, not just for me. I mean, this is not isolated to me. You have the same benefit. Anyone who's been through this has the ability to change those around them simply by saying, I suffer from this and describing what it feels like. So right. here I am. I'm publicly speaking about it. Uh, and there's not a lot of people, especially in the media, who were doing the same thing, which right. I quite enjoyed, to be honest with you, because <laughs> because, because it stood out, right? And it That's was right. like, you know, it, there was this perception that it, it was – enormously brave on my part, which I, I think is crap. It didn't take any bravery whatsoever. It was it was something I was comfortable with. I was never afraid of it. Right. But then TSN gets purchased by Bell. And Bell, all of a sudden, now I'm working for the company in Canada that is most sensitive and most driven to change the way we perceive mental health. Right. So they then started this thing called Bell Let's Talk Day. So I was involved in it right from the beginning. On the first Bell Let's Talk Day, uh, they released the documentary that I did, Darkness and Hope. Right. And they played that at 7 p.m. on Bell Let's Talk Day 2012. And that was, for me, um, a really special night because right. it all kind of just added to um, to me finding out the value of sharing. So I've been involved with Bell Let's Talk Day since the beginning because I work for this company and they look for people who will speak on their behalf and I'm one of those people. No, and it's been, I mean, it's been huge, especially this last year. Um, the, you know, record numbers of, of tweets and, uh, other kind of communication. And what was the number? Do you remember what the number was, uh, that was raised this year? Uh, you know, I don't remember what it was, but I know that there was over a hundred million yeah. uh, responses of some kind with the with the hashtag um, Bell Let's Talk. So, I mean, that's extraordinary when you when you think of it. Um, we're a country one tenth the size of the United States. We'd be talking over a billion in the states. I mean, that's crazy. And this is something that really nobody cared about before. This was this was the the silent killer. This was the thing that you didn't talk about when someone in your family suffered from it. You never mentioned it. No. And now people don't often mention, but they do it just a little bit more than we used to. So uh, it, it's it's crazy how this program, Bell Let's Talk, has been embraced. I mean, and with the progression of social media to make it, you know, ridiculous how easily we can reach out to a large group of people and all become a small community of billions of people, you know, it's just taken off. And I, I mean, it's only going to get better in the future, I believe, just with people feeling safer talking about it and feeling protected and feeling like they are not alone. I mean, it's only going to get larger from here, I believe. And then, you know, you, you transition to this hashtag sick knock week. Let, let's talk about that. Sure. Uh, what you just described, Sean, Yeah. you talked about social media and about how it's so easy to reach out to others and make them feel like they're not alone. That's everything that Sick Not Week is, and really no more than that. It's a community, or at least it's a created community that we uh, that we hope will grow. Because it's kind of one of these unique things in life where when you share for the purpose of helping somebody else, you also help yourself when you join a community thinking, oh, OK, well, I'm just going to just going to sit on the edge here. I'm going to read what people are saying. I'm going to watch some videos, but I'm not going to be an active participant in this. Right. When you join, you start to help yourself because you start to see, hey, you know what? I'm not the only one. Hey, you know what? I'm not special or unique from this standpoint. I'm, I'm one of a lot of people. And believe me, no one wants to be special or unique when it comes to their illness. Right. So, so then you, you, you tweet once and right away you have now not only taken from this community, but you've given to the community. So it, it's like it, this community feeds unto itself. It, it gets nourished by people joining and by people taking from it and then giving back. And all I really want to do. And when I say I, it, it's, it's not really accurate anymore. I mean, Sick Not Week lived in my head for three, four years, right? Okay. Because, that, I mean, I, I would talk about it, but I never did anything about it. But now Sick Not Week is, is uh, a couple of dozen people in Toronto and uh, close to a thousand people across the country. Right. And everyone that's part of the community has a part ownership in this because the only thing we do is we add to this pool, this pool of sharing. So really what Sick Not Week 
uh, I wanted it to be was a community where people could join and feel more comfortable with themselves. And with comfort comes less shame and less embarrassment. And with comfort comes sharing. And with sharing comes help. So what you described was easy over social media is exactly why we did it. Awesome. I've, I've looked over the website and I see that, you know, people will will upload or they'll submit their own stories. Basically, it's a community of people telling their own stories, sharing, and uh, which is great. And it's a great way of uh, allowing people to feel welcome or secure or comfortable in their own mental illness issues. Yeah, and, and you know, it, it, when you share, like I said, you benefit because you feel like, okay, well, you know what? I have taken this this awful thing inside me, which for me personally, I mean, forget about illnesses of people that I've cared about, which <laughs> have been, like everybody has stories where they go, oh, my God, that's so hard to cope with uh, the illness of someone that I love. But for me specifically, the by far the toughest thing that I've had to deal with and by far the worst thing in my life has been depression. So right. now I get to take this thing inside me, which has been uh, has been detracting from my life for 20 years and use it. I get to use it for something good. I get to take it. It's like I got this poison. And when I take it out of me now, all of a sudden it nourishes other people. So it goes from being my enemy to being my friend. And that everybody feels that does this when you write a story or when you even just tweet or anything you do to share all of a sudden you go oh my gosh i've just used this terrible thing which may not go away and certainly isn't going to go away because i have started sharing but now i feel just a little bit better because i can justify it in my head i know that there is some use for this pain absolutely i mean for me personally coming from the first responder world and i was a uh a communications officer at uh, a medical communication center here in Nova Scotia. When I, you know, broke, if you will, from PTSD, one of the big triggers for me was the phone. I hated the phone. I didn't want to talk to anybody on the phone, and that became really difficult. So one of the issues through doing this podcast has been I have to do interviews, and even though I'm, I may have to push myself a little bit to get into the interview. Once it's done and once I'm into it, I feel so much better, and it's helped me progress you know, in communicating about my story and, and helping others tell their story to help so many people that it really does. It, it helps you, but it also helps so many others just by, by pushing through it, I find. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it really is give help, get help. It's like this equation that doesn't really exist in a lot of other areas, but here it does. When you say, okay, well, you know, I, I mean, you're doing this podcast, right? And this podcast is, is, is going to change a life. That's what I, I always refer to it as only one life. I say, like, you go, your goal when you do this is not to change the world, but change a life. Because if you change one, you change more. And once you start ch trying to change a group of people, you change the tone of what you're doing. This has to be me and you, Sean. The only, the only two people in this conversation are me and you. And by sharing, if I can make a difference in your life, then all of a sudden now my life is a little better. That's awesome. Uh, Michael, how can, how can our listeners help in any way? You know, help promote this Sick Not Week initiative of yours. Is well, I, I think I, th I think it's pretty easy, uh, and and it, this my goal is not to become have sick not weak become like the number one mental health website or in, initiative. I, I really could care less about that. Right. It, it, it's it's like I just want people to to understand that for the most part, if they share, their lives will be better. So specifically with Sick Not Weak, if, if that's what you want to turn to, you go to sicknotweak.com and you just start to read some of the articles and watch some of the videos. I do a daily, a daily we call it Land's Blog. Uh, we, yeah, we I've seen them, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and that was suggested actually from a guy from Halifax who had this great idea. He said, how about Land's Blog? It was like, yeah, I like that. So I, I, I do this uh, and, and I'll be doing tomorrow's uh, later on tonight. I try to, I try to I, I just try to make a statement, which is every time you go to this website, there's there's someone there. There's someone who who didn't file this 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 blog six months ago. You know how you go to some people's websites and they blog and they don't update them for two months and they they claim that, you know, you're going to be able to follow them through their travels. 
else. No. <laughs> yeah. So, exactly. so when you go to our site, you know that there's living, breathing people who understand you. Right. So go to sicknotweek.com, and if you're so inclined, uh, email us at volunteer at sicknotweek.com, and we would love for you to uh, assist in this, in spreading the word. And especially if you want to go and look at some of the clothes that we have created, I mean, we right. need revenue, right? I mean, th- right. that's that's a big issue for us now. We got some original money from people who said, yeah, I believe in this, but now we have to exist on our own, and we can't be here just waiting for donations. We are a not-for-profit, and our goal is to be able to find people who want to partner with us to get the message out. So... That's the story. But even if you never go to Sick Not Week, even if you you could care less about it, which, I, like I said, my goal isn't to get people to embrace Sick Not Week. My goal is to get people to embrace sharing. So they will, about themselves or about the people around them, feel a little bit better. Because the, unfor- the forgotten people in all of this, uh, Sean, are the caregivers, the people that love those that struggle. And right. there's a lot more of them than there are of us. And those people feel incredibly isolated and frustrated and hopeless because there's this disconnect they know that they won't understand what they can do and the mindset of the person that they're trying to help that's true michael you you mentioned a couple ways to get in contact with you whether how else can we find you 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 know where are you on twitter and other social media uh i'm on twitter at hey landsberg h-e-y that's kind of like uh i carried that over from off the record so (laughs) um i i started tweeting two and a half years ago right i had never sent a tweet and then all of a sudden uh i was actually in normandy which became like the greatest trip of my life because i'm a world war ii i'm fascinated by world war ii um and i started tweeting from there and then i i just tweeted I, i don't even remember but i just tweeted hey you know what if you feel like you're lonely If you feel like nobody understands you because you suffer from a mental illness, just know that you're not alone. I get you. I understand you. Now, what I probably just said was more than 140 characters, so I did find a way to abbreviate it and turn Y-O-U to U and S-E-E to just the letter C. But even in 140 characters, that came back to me that I had said something of significance. So right. I think basically every day since then, I have tweeted something about mental health. And really virtually all of it is is just saying, hey, I get it. And I'll describe what it feels like to me. Like I think one of the, one of the most, one of the tweets that resonated the most was one when I said, hey, anybody else out there find when they're really struggling but you're forced to go out for dinner that you literally pray that no one orders coffee because you can't stand the idea you're going to have to sit in that chair for another 10 minutes. So when the waiter comes over and says, can I get you anything else? You you face this really big crisis, which is it's rude to jump in and say, no, we don't want anything else. We'll just take the check. But that's what you want to do. But that's the kind of sharing that has benefit because people go, yeah, yeah, that's me. That's what you want to engender in people. You want the reaction. That's me. And if you can get it, then you yeah. can make people feel a little bit less lonely. It's just everyday situations that we all go through and we all think about, but no one talks about. Exactly. And, no. and you know, that's that's the goal. I mean, the, the, this is not being talked about. This is being, you know, swept under the rug. It was unacceptable for people to talk about this. So, you know, our goal is to try to make it a little bit more uh, acceptable. So at Hey Landsberg, at uh, Sick Not Week, you can, you know what, you can just email me. I, I try to respond to people that reach out and, and don't just say, see, I used to just get emails that said the same thing. Hey, Landsberg, you suck. And <laughs> I, I never figured I had to respond to those. But now when you, when you get things that, that are really significant, you kind of owe it to people to respond. So michael.landsberg at sicknotweek.com. And uh, I, I try to I try to respond, uh, and uh, sometimes I fail. And today I found that out, and a woman tweeted that said, "Hey, you know, you know, Michael, you, uh, you, you know, you p- apparently only pay attention to people who are." And she had some type of description that didn't describe her, and she she was right from the standpoint. Not that that was my motivation, but I had failed to respond to her, and I felt terrible. Right? I mean, she's right, but. Um, I think if you embark on this and say, I will respond to 90 percent uh, and the other 10 percent won't be a conscious decision, but will simply be I forgot, then um, it's still worthy of, of you doing. Absolutely. Uh, Michael, I won't I won't uh, keep you here much longer. But what if you were to give if you were to give a statement, you know, right now to people who are struggling with mental health, who feel they can't talk or feel like they're alone, 
If you were to tell them one thing, what would it be? I would tell them, uh, and this is not something I have not thought about. Uh, I would tell them that sharing is an acquired skill. That if you've never done it before, and if you've been afraid to do it, and if you've kept it inside, you're not very good at it. And it's so intimidating. And it's so scary, the thought of you saying these words, I'm suffering from depression. But if you do it once, I promise you that the second time will be just a little bit easier. And within a certain amount of time, you will be more comfortable with it. Because if you are keeping it to yourself, that means you have bought into the stigma. And the best way to prove to yourself that you no longer believe the stigma is is to share and find out that people are responsive. And especially if you do it within a protective community like Sick Not Weak. If you don't share, there is never going to be help. And when you keep this as a secret, you send a message to yourself that somehow you are to blame. You are not to blame. Nobody is to blame for their mental illness any more than people. I mean, we're less to blame for our our mental illness than some people who have heart disease, who maybe are obese, right? right? right. I mean, they have risk factors. I have no risk factors for depression. It just hit me. So teach yourself not to be proud of your illness, because that sounds ridiculous, but not to be ashamed of it. And you best do that by by sharing just a little bit at a time. Wow. That's awesome, Michael. Um, again, I can't thank you enough for coming on. I think uh, what you're doing is awesome. I thank you for doing it. And it certainly has helped people like me, one, to try to come to grips with mental illness and be safe talking about it, two, to try to – you know, try to start up this podcast and try to get people talking and and try to get it more into the public eye. Uh, I can't thank you enough, and it's such a thrill to have you on. And I just want to tell you that if there's ever anything that we can do here at the podcast to help get your message out or anything at all, just all you have to do is say the word, and we will be there uh, for sure. And um, we'd love whoa, to whoa, have whoa, you on. Whoa. Oh, go ahead. I just heard some uh, East Coast in your voice. Absolutely. Yes. It's the, first, it's the first little bit I heard. I heard for sure. <laughs> yeah, definitely an East Coast boy for sure. Uh, there. So again, you said it again for sure. And again, I say it way too much. I say for sure way too much. I know. You it. know, you, uh, you you said you appreciate me doing this, and you, you know what you owe me for this? What do I owe you? Nothing. I'm, I'm, you, you're giving me a chance to talk about something that I've clearly made the conscious decision that I want to talk about. So instead of you saying to me, "Thank you very much." Let me say to you, Sean, thanks for giving me this chance. Uh, invite me back because um, my goal is just to do what you and I have done, which is desensitize people by talking about it. And you should uh, you should send me a link to this so I can send it out to uh, a bunch of people, many of whom may ignore it. But who cares if we help one person? <laughs> right. And if we help one person, then we've had the best day of our life. You're absolutely right. Well, Michael, until next time then, I'll say uh, take care of yourself and everybody around you and be safe, and we'll chat again soon. No, that's not the way you should have wrapped it up. What you should have said, I'll say, Michael, you're going to be back for sure. Um, this is great. You're a good interviewer, too, really. I like you. You're very relaxed, and uh, I was actually caught off guard at how good you are because most people who decide to do their own podcast really aren't that good. But well, you're great. Thanks. <laughs> All right, Michael, you're going to be back for sure. Thanks, man. Thank you. Those of you that know me well know that I am an avid uh, mixed martial arts fan, being a mixed martial arts referee myself. So it is with great pleasure that I have my next guest on. It's a a thrill for me. Throughout his 14-year combat sport career, my guest had many accomplishments, including the in amateur boxing super heavyweight champion of Canada, in K1 2005 K1 World Grand Prix champion in, in Hawaii, in mixed martial arts. My guest was first was the first international Valley Tudo champion, also UFC 8 tournament runner-up, UFC 10 tournament semifinalist, and Pride Grand Prix 2000 quarterfinalist. I'm very honored to welcome. Big Daddy Gary Goodridge to the podcast. How are you today, Gary? I am excellent. Thank you. What a great intro. Thank you. <laughs> oh no, you're welcome. It's it's my thrill for sure. And thank you for taking time. Uh, as, and as of late, of course, you've been you've been speaking out and been an advocate for for mental health and trying to break down stigmas on mental illness. So we're going to have a chat about that, Gary. But I th- I'm sure our listeners would love to know y- your story and your journey to where you are today. Mm-hmm. 
No problem. I got a lot. <laughs> so, so go ahead and, and, and tell us how you how how you got here to where you are today. Well, I started the very uh, my very first concussion that I ever had. Um, the very first time I was ever concussed was in boxing in um, in the nineties. Right. I think I fought David Bosto, uh, the best in Canada fight, the best in the United States. Oh wow. And uh that was in, that was taking place in Florida. Uh, my boxing coach Norm Bell was he wasn't on the Canadian um boxing team or or their roster so he didn't get to go with us. So it was about my five months mark of ever boxing. <laughs> oh, and wow. what happened was uh sorry, my my ninth month mark of ever boxing. Yeah. It was I think my fifth fight. So I, I was I moved up fast through the ranks simply because I was stronger than everybody else. Right. Not because I was a great boxer. Anyways, in saying that, uh, I went to the, to face the best in the United, United States fight, the best in Canada and Florida. I believe it was back in 95. We fought the first round and it was, it looked to me it was a draw. The second round, uh, he started pulling away and the third round he just mopped up the floor with me. <laughs> You know, I was a, a, an organic punching bag, really, for the last round. Right. And um, I guess they didn't want to call call me out, somebody because I had gone so far already. Right. So, anyways, um, the guy mopped up the floor. I was just uh, my face was a punching bag, so uh, he ended up doing just that, being a puncher. He ended up uh, becoming a professional boxer after, but. Uh, in this uh, instance, after the phone, after the fight, I jumped out of the ring, and the only thing on my mind is I had to call Norm. I had to call Norm. <laughs> so um, the people, the doctors checked me out in the ring, and everybody was checked out. Everyone passed everything, and they said, "Okay, do go ahead." So I went to call Norm. I went straight to the phone. I called Norm. I called him collect. I said, "Hey," uh, he says, uh, "How are you doing?" I says, um, "I'm okay. The fight just finished." And I, I really can't remember very much because it was still a little flurry, yeah, uh, fuzzy. So I talked to him for about um, 30 seconds, and then uh, he asked me to put somebody on the phone. Well, I put somebody on the phone, and from there I was taken to the hospital because uh, the nor the re- the um, people around me didn't know didn't know me, so they couldn't tell if there was something wrong with right, me. Right, right. Here I called this guy. A uh, 24 hour drive away, and he could tell me right away that there's something wrong. Right. So the, that was my first concussion. The thing is, is that how many people I see that many people have all these people in their corner, but really you got to have somebody that knows you. Yeah, that, that's a good point. You. Yeah. Exactly. Because this was my problem. I, I, I had all sorts of people in my corner that didn't know me that I really didn't know. I had to call. A 24-hour drive away to call to tell him that to tell me that there was something wrong. So I went to the hospital, and and that was the very first concussion I ever had. And I fought MMA. I fought Pride. Pride was MMA, and right. I fought K1. I fought uh, MMA for for seven years. I only got one concussion through Gilbert Ivel. Oh, really? Um, yes. Yeah. He gave me a high kick to the head and uh, knocked right. me out. Yes, that's right. Wow, that was a that was a good kick. <laughs> and then from there, I had another um, thirteen concussions. Wow! But it was all in K one because it was all about knockouts. Everything was about knockouts. True. Yep. Um, uh, I don't. If anyone ever sees it, it, it that's what that's what it's all about. If, you, if you're not knocking somebody out, they're knocking you out. And I mean, and, and, and in the in the in the Grand Prix, you're fighting tournaments. You're fighting multiple fights a night in K one. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So it was nothing. And um, a lot of the fight, a lot of the fighters that I was that I did fight with, actually, two of them have uh, committed suicide. Really. Um, and I I believe one hundred percent because of uh, CTE had issues with the Reds. Well, well, that brings um, us to CTE, Gary. I mean, I know you've been you've been diagnosed with degenerative dementia, which is a form of CTE or chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which yeah. is which is in the news these days, big time. Obviously, with the NFL and with major sports in general, and you see people that are retiring in their early twenties because they're just terrified of this of these concussion syndromes that are happening. And you've been diagnosed with this. When, when did you? Uh, when were you diagnosed with this? I was diagnosed with this about. Um 
I, really after my career. Really? What happened was um I was doing fighting uh, K1. Right. And um they went I went to get looked at and the doctor from there went to another doctor and then um after after sorry, after I finished fighting. Yeah. After right after my career, I had. Have you, have you ever watched um, Concussion, the, the movie Concussion? I haven't yet, but I want to watch it. Please watch that that story because it avidly depicts exactly what's wrong with my head. It wow, is okay. One hundred percent right on. I, I can't believe how they could just uh, get all this information and, and and put it out like that. I was so impressed with that movie. Okay, Anyways, awesome. Uh, yeah, no, we'll definitely have to watch that for sure. Yeah, I was dating this girl. Um, I was dating this uh, beautiful lady, and I had every intention of marrying this girl, and I, and I still love her to this day. And I, I just kept on having anger rages with this woman. Right. And she was only 110 pounds, and the straw that broke the camel's back yeah. was um, I ended up with my hands around her neck, squeezing the life out of her. Wow. And um, because I didn't want to hit her. Um, next thing you know, um, I'm, I'm in a police car being taken away and went to jail. From then on, right from then, from that point on, then, um, I was being looked at. A lawyer looked at me, uh, and then he sent me to his doctors, and that, that, um, the, the head of neuroscience in Toronto, Dr. Ocelani, diagnosed me with, uh, CTE. Um, oh. I was the first person in Canada, uh, actually the first person that I know of. That's been that's a lie that's being diagnosed. Right, because usually they diagnose that uh, after when death. you're dead. Right, exactly. They right. diagnosed me with CT. From then on, uh, once the uh, once the lights was put on it, then it was easy. Um, simply because then they knew what drugs to put me on. Right, and I, I don't think they they the, the the drugs stopped me from my anger. They stop uh, they stop the, uh, the the rage. Right, and the drugs stop um, doesn't stop on. Um, uh, anything else? Just stop the rage and right. the acting out. That's all. That's all the drugs does. Well, huh. which is good. It, yeah. it makes me be able to to interact with people in the world and not be angry all the time. Which is a huge thing. But yeah, from there I uh, I went to jail. I had my I had my first stint in jail. Well, my, the only stint in jail. Here I am. Wow, that's a crazy story. I'm sure it would make for a good movie, Gary. The uh, like through your mixed martial arts, I mean boxing as well, but your mixed martial arts career and your training, I'm I'm sure you were old school. So were you were you sparring like hard every day, also in training? Oh yeah, oh, yeah too. And anybody that uh, anyone that fights, if they're not fighting, if they're not, if if you're facing a lion, you got to train with lions. Right. You can't you can't face a lion and not train with lions because. If you train with sheep, you're going to fight like a sheep. You <laughs> yeah. have to face yeah. lions to fight lions. So every time, you have to put it in vision in your head that every fight you're going to have is a lion. So therefore, you have to fight lions. You're going to be hit by lions. You're going to be hit hard. You're going to be thumped out. You're going to be, everything is going to come at you hard. So, so you have to be able to protect yourself from that. Right. So do you feel that there's no, I mean, I hear some fighters now, and they're trying to tone down how much they actually spar. Uh, because of the concussion issue, but do you feel that 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 you can be successful doing that, or do you feel like you you need that? Because what you just said, that like you need to have that sparring time in order in order to be successful as a fighter. Unless they can come up with some other um, you know animated thing that you can do on TV, right? And spar. Uh, there's absolutely no way to, in order to to body that. You need a body on body. You need to be getting punches. You need to be able to see them out and react. You 100% need that. Right. Yeah, no, I, I can understand that totally. And the, the other issue that has come up out of this is, is weight cutting. So you have people that are dehydrating themselves massively in order to make weight and basically going into the ring to fight with dry brain because they haven't, they haven't rehydrated their bodies enough, especially their brain enough, in order to have that cushioning of fluid that it normally has, and then, uh, you know, and the, the instance of concussions are up. I mean, do you feel that, that we should, that the whole weight-cutting issue should be looked at as well as far as, like, do we need to be cutting weight, or should you just fight at the weight that you naturally are? You know what? To be, to be 100% honest with you, yeah, I have been over 200 pounds since I was 10 years old. Right, yeah, not an issue for you, for sure. I have, I have never had to cut, cut weight, so I don't know anything about it. Right. I, 
Um, I, I, I'd be talking out my ass because I have no idea. <laughs> no, I appreciate that. No, that's, yeah, absolutely. I know, yeah, you haven't, as a super heavyweight, you haven't had to cut weight. Uh, no. for sure. I mean, uh, I think, uh, in, in what I've read and, and, and listened to, I think it's definitely something that needs to be looked at because we're putting fighters in jeopardy needlessly. I, I think, uh, that maybe it can be tweaked. And I know that some organizations have tried to tweak their, their weight cutting uh, protocols and and that's the thing. Uh, especially with the think. no IV rehydration as well. So absolutely, it, you know what? I honestly think my honestly think my opinion, personal opinion. Yeah. MMA, UFC, style fighting, MMA is one of the safest um, things that you can do. It is the K one fighting right. where everything was about knockouts. Right, that's everything's about head kick. Yeah, the, yeah, knockouts. I got cut in with. I fought MMA for seven years. I had one concussion in seven years. I fought K1 for seven years. I had 14 concussions in that seven years. So you do the math. Right, exactly. Yeah, I know it's pretty evident there. Yeah. Pretty evident. Now, I know, Gary, you've, uh, recently you've, uh, you've, I've seen a couple of videos and articles and you speaking out about your condition. As far as, so your, your condition, how does it affect you? What, what is the, the most, what what are the things that impact your day now as far as the issues that you have to overcome with the CTE? Well, with the CTE, well, I'm, I'm, here, here we are. We're talking at uh, 1025 in the morning. I'm still in bed. Right. I had to get out of my my bed to make this call because I thought it was going to be a video call. Uh, right. I'm, I'm still in, yeah, I'm, right. I'm, bed, I'm in bed. Um, I came back to best truth. I wasn't video call. I'm, right. I'll be in bed probably till about uh, 3 or 4 o'clock before I get out. No, in the, in the, I have, uh, so go ahead. The, the depression never really leaves. They haven't given me anything for depression, but, um, the, my suicidal thoughts and, and, and everything are, are gone. So I must be doing something, but right. I, as far as I know, I don't, I don't have anything for depression. I take these pills really to stop me from, stop me from that, from that rage. Muscle. Yes. Right. And the rage. Right. Talking funny and having the rage. The, uh, that is, um, the rage is gone, right? But and I'm not talking funny, but I, I don't think it stops me from anything else, right? Is now is is this a normal day for you? As far as do you normally not get up until in the afternoon? I unless you have, to, you have to. Is when I get in bed. Uh, when I get in bed, I really don't get up till night. I, I don't really come out of bed. I try to find myself some things to do during the day, but uh, I always end up in my bed because. Uh, uh, it's depression. I, I'm, I'm depressed. Right. I'm depressed, but I'm not. Uh, I'm not suicidal. I'm not suicidal depressed. Right. I'm depressed that I don't want to get in my bed. I don't. I don't want to leave the house. It's a. You know, I got two dogs. Yeah. To get me out of the house. And, <laughs> yeah. You know, I, That's um, right. I just. Uh, I'm depressed. No, I, I hear that, and I know you've been speaking out about it, you know, in in the uh, in public and on you know in newspapers and on videos. Is that something that you want to continue to do to be an advocate and speak out and make this issue safe to talk about? Is that something you'd like to continue to do? <laughs> absolutely, I, I um, <coughs> absolutely. I just started a new um a new thing um uh, we're on Twitter at nine one one well. Oh, what is it? Nine one one well. <coughs> nine one one well. Right. We're just um, um I, I teamed up with a, a friend of mine. Well, we became friends because of the, our disease. Right. Uh, we have uh, he has problems, other problems that uh, bring him to suicidal. Um, you know, so we're we're just trying to um, you know, we're just saying, hey, listen, you don't have to be, you don't have to be this, you don't have to be that, you don't have to get a punch in your head to be this. Right. Uh, you know, there's so many other things that can bring you to this point. You know, there's 175 children a day. That are committed suicide in this world, wow. you know. So um, you know, the, we're trying to get on top of it to, to help people. I, I hope that I can help somebody because. Uh, oh, there's no know. doubt. There's no doubt. You've you've already helped people, Gary. You've already done it. So you uh, know, everything else is icing for sure. You've yeah. you've you've helped me already just by watching your videos and watching your statements and letting you know, letting me know that you know again, I'm not alone, and we're not alone in this. And there's a huge community of people that need help and want to talk and need to be part of something and are, are yeah. looking for that. And you've already done that, Gary. You, you have. Um, oh, great. You yeah, know, that warms my heart. So thank you very much. I, I, oh, you're I'm very great. welcome. It's I my pleasure. It's my pleasure. How, how can people, so you just mentioned that, that new initiative that you're with. So how can listeners 
find you. So there's that initiative. Is that at 911well? Is that what it does? Is that? Yes, at 911well. Or, um, on Twitter? Find me, yes. I'm on Twitter. Gary H. Goodridge. At Gary H. Goodridge. Okay. Um, that's where I am, but uh, I'll be just feeding out. Um, uh, actually, um, I'm on Twitter every day doing a lot of things, uh, inspiration. Yes, I see those posts. Uh, yeah, lots of posts. I, I try to, uh, you know, I find them and I throw them because uh, I, I feel <coughs> basically it, it, it helps me right. to read it. To, to do it, uh, it, it helps me. For sure. Uh, that, that's sure. the same sort of, that's the same thing I get too from doing this. It helps me out. It, it progresses me in my journey. I just hope to bring other people with me. That's sort of okay. what I, what I try to do. Um, yeah. So we got the, we got, we got you on Twitter. Is there any other way that people can get a hold of you, Gary? Uh, uh Twitter. Twitter is number one. I'm Twitter's on, number one. I'm on, Perfect. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Twitter all the time. <laughs> from Twitter. I'm, I'm Twitter all the time. Nobody tweets more than me, I think. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. So, uh, Gary, I won't, I won't take up much more of your time, but if you were to say something, if you could say something to all the, the people that are listening to this that may be struggling or may struggle in the future and may, you know, think they're alone, if you, you could say one thing to them, what would it be? Uh, you know, if you can dream it, you can become it. Nice. If you can, if you can dream it, you can become it. So you can... Anybody who can do anything in this world, you just have to dream it and believe in yourself that you can do it. That's, That's number perfect. one. That's perfect, Gary. I want to, Gary. I, what you're doing is awesome. I think you're awesome. It was a pleasure talking to you. You've been a, I've been a big fan of yours for years and years, and uh, it was an, it was great talking to you and hearing about what you know what you're going through and how you're overcoming it. Uh, you know, I'm sure this has been the probably the toughest fight of your career, probably. Uh, it certainly is. It's the toughest thing I ever did. Um, if it wasn't for uh, if it wasn't for all the medicine I'm taking, the medicine I'm taking for uh, for all this other crap, uh, I, right. I'm 100 percent sure I'd be dead. Wow. Well, I'm certainly glad you are not. And if there is anything that I or the podcast or any listeners can do to help your cause or or help out in anything that you may be trying, you may try to do in the future. All you need to do is reach out to me, and we will be there in whatever way we can. Uh, always, uh, you know, I always have your back, and will help out any way I can. Um, and I just want to thank you again for doing this, Gary. No, thank you. Thanks, Gary. And uh, the pleasure was all mine. And be safe, and take care of yourself, Gary. And we'll hope to have you on again. Yes, sir. Thank you. All have right. Thanks. At this time, I'd like to introduce our next guest. He enjoyed an 18-year professional hockey career, which included being an NHL All-Star, Stanley Cup winner, and Olympic gold medalist. Off the ice, he was awarded the Canadian Humanitarian Award, the Queen's Jubilee Medallion, is an honorary chief and recipient of the Aboriginal Inspire Award. In 2014, he was awarded an honorary doctorate in science from the University of Guelph Humber for outstanding contributions to the mental health of Canadians. Most recently, he was bestowed with a second honorary doctorate in laws from Brandon University in recognition for his contributions combating child sexual abuse and for his outstanding efforts to promote healing and recovery. As if this wasn't enough, he's also a two-time best-selling author of the books Playing with Fire and Conversations with a Rattlesnake. It's with great pleasure that I introduce to you Theo Fleury. Now, this is normally when you would hear Theo Fleury start to talk, but because of me being a bonehead and my equipment not uh, starting to record when it should have, we missed the first five minutes of Theo speaking. So I'm going to catch you up, and then we're going to join Theo in progress. I asked Theo to start telling his, uh, his journey of mental health. And basically he started off by saying that mental health issues ran in his family. His mom had mental health issues and his brothers also, which is common uh, with a lot of people that have uh, mental health issues and, you know, including myself. So he started to talk about that and the fact that he had, growing up, he had this genetic history or disposition for mental health issues as well as experiencing physical trauma 
through his childhood. So, as he put it, he had sort of a, a double whammy to contend with. And like most of us who, who grow up with mental health issues, not realizing that they're a mental health issue, we self-medicate, such as drugs, alcohol, sex addictions, are all very common. And then he went on to talk about, you know, how he dealt with his mental health issues and will join him in progress right now. Once I lick one thing or get something under control, then I tend to gravitate towards something else, right? Right. And so, but for me, when my mental health issues start to, started to dissipate was when I told my story and you know, where I started to talk openly about my, ex- my experience in childhood. And what happened was, is that, is that my story, which I thought was uncommon, mm. is actually the most common things that, that happens to people in this lifetime. Right. Yeah. And then, you know, running into Kim Barthel and, and writing conversations with the rattlesnake was, somebody who explained to me the science of my condition and it was the scientific explanation of how my brain works that there's that famous scene in goodwill hunting Uh where robin williams and matt damon where robin williams says it's not your fault it's not your fault it's not your fault it's not your fault and it was the science explanation of sort of how I got to where I was, was the moment that I realized there wasn't one thing that I could have changed about my life to make it any different. Hmm. It took away all the shame, all the guilt, most of the anger. (laughs) And, uh, you know, I really had a new perspective on life. Right. But through the process of, you know, therapy over the last uh 16 years yeah and that process of of therapy is peeling all the layers of the onion off right getting to the core of what my issues were and so what i realized and and what i think most people you know we have these core beliefs and so what i realized was i was always abandoned always felt neglected Hmm. Always felt not good enough. Always felt not lovable. Yeah. And even the fact that I even existed. And, you know, when I discovered that, you know, it really made sense to me. And, and, and most people who suffer through mental health issues either have all four of those or a mixture of the four. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I know my, me, myself, I, I have all the, I had all those feelings myself, still have them, still battle yeah. them on a daily basis. Yeah, and it, and it's a, a rewiring of the brain through conversation that helps us, you know, think about ourselves differently. What kind of therapy have you taken part in? Have you taken part in different kinds of therapy? Done every type of therapy known to mankind. Did you do EMDR therapy? Yes. What did you think about that? I loved it. It, it, it was a tremendous game changer for my PTSD. I'm going through that now. Uh, that's what I'm doing for my PTSD, and it's amazing. You would ne- it's hard to explain to somebody because it seems so simple, but yeah. it's uh, it seems well, like it's, something out of a sci-fi movie, but it's it really works. Yeah, well, it's a process of a very simple. Uh, are you using are you using the light or are you using tappers? What what type light? Of- I have the light bar. Okay. Yeah. So rapid eye movement in the process of therapy helps you tap into your unconscious brain. Yeah. And, you know, it allows you to bring all those things that you've sort of compartmentalized or put into files, which that's what the PTSD is. Those things that you've sort of put into file drawers or compartmentalized. Right. That keep popping up in dreams or triggers or, you know, whatever it is. And, and uh, the process of EMDR allows you to take a look at it in a safe environment. Right. And then you can reframe 
you know, that experience so that it doesn't have the kick or the bite that, uh, that it once had. And I find it's almost instant. Like as soon as you deal with a memory, it's like, boom, it's yeah. fine. You can talk about it. It doesn't bother you. It's yeah. quite amazing. I mean, you, you say you've, you mean you've done many different things. Have you, did you find like some better than others or do you think it was all necessary to do all the different kinds in order to fully package up what you needed to do? Well, you know, I'm the type of person I'll try anything once, right? Yeah, yeah. When I walked into my first treatment center, I had no idea, right? right? I had all these problems and all these issues. And so what happened was I walked into therapy and the treatment center with absolutely zero tools in my toolbox. Right. The only tool that I had was coping. Mm. Right. Surviving. Yeah. And that meant, you know, addictions and, you know, all these things I walked into the first treatment center with. And when I left the first treatment center, I had three or four tools, mm. you know, and then the next place I went, yeah. I had more tools and some more tools and some more tools. And, and, and so I have a toolbox that is full of things. Yeah. That I use on a daily basis to manage right. my trauma, my addictions, my mental health issues that I didn't have when I started. And really that is the process of this whole therapy um, journey. Theo, was there ever a time in your professional hockey career where you can ever remember talking about mental health with another professional hockey player? Uh, like, was it talked about at all? I mean, I know in my circles it wasn't. I mean, you'd never talk about it. No, and that's, you know, that's part of this whole yeah. stigma that we're trying to, you know, advocate for on a daily basis, right? Yeah. Why you have a bo- It's why you have a podcast. Yeah, absolutely. Is that the most effective treatment that I felt that has worked for me is conversation. That's it. Yeah, for sure. There's no magic pill. There's no magic formula. Nothing. It's being in a safe environment and the person that you're talking to is a trusted friend. Yeah. That's how you get all this shit out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's true. I mean, feeling safe is, is the number one thing. Now, I mean, so after you started talking about it then, after you came out, did you find that people gravitated towards you that may not have talked about it before to maybe say, hey, I'm, I'm going through some things too? Well, since 2009, when the book came out, Playing with Fire, we've had over 500,000 people indirectly or directly say two words, me too. Wow. You know, and yeah. and that's the magic of courage. For sure. Huh. That's amazing. That, you know, especially I was talking about it with Michael Landsberg, social yeah. media today. I mean, one of the greatest things you can do with social media, I think, is what we're doing is helping others because there's nothing else that allows you to reach out and almost create a small community of billions of people, but still feels small. Yeah. You can reach out to anybody. Absolutely. There's no question that there's there's lots of bad about social media, but social media used in this format is an incredible way to end, you know, the stigma that's attached to mental health, PTSD, you know, all of these things that, and, and really what it is, is, is it's ignorance. Yeah. Is people do not or aren't educated around the subject of, you know, mental health and PTSD and all that stuff. They are just ignorant. And because they are ignorant, uh, you know, and because, because like we talked, we're not good enough, not lovable, all these things, Mm. these people, by putting a negative spin on mental health, mental issues, we're going to pick up that sign every time that says not good enough. We're going to pick it up. We're going to hold it over our head. Right, right. Right. And so that is part of this whole stigma is that. The few ignorant, uneducated people 
are have created this stigma. Right. And so social media is a great opportunity for us, all of us who experience, you know, mental health is is to talk about it, not be afraid or feel shame or. So, yeah. I, yeah. Um, I sorry. Go ahead, Theo. Go ahead. I think that we've come a long ways. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we have a long way to go. Do you think that have you uh has the NHL been supportive of you like through your speaking and through what and and also with with that, do you think that professional sports leagues and you probably are most comfortable with talking about the NHL, do you think that they are on a learning curve with how to better support their athletes who may be going through mental health issues? Yeah, and I don't like to single out one entity. Right, right. This is this is a worldwide epidemic. Absolutely, it is. Yes. So if you're, well, you know, we're talking about, you know, we're talking about people in general. It doesn't matter. Oh, yeah, it's it's a human issue, yeah. it's a, for sure. It's bigger than you know one entity, and I think the NHL, the NFL, Major League Baseball, MLS, you know, all these entities have people. And, yeah, and, that's right. They're people business. Yeah. And so one out of three people experience childhood trauma. So, you know, do the math. So you know, that's the, staggering. That's a staggering number. Yeah. The people that work in these leagues, you know, you do the math and it's very simple to figure out that pro athletes suffer, you know, just like everybody else. Oh, for sure. They definitely do. Now, Theo, you have your site, your theoflurry14.com. Which I, know, which I looked at, and I know that's a way for you to uh, – it's a sort of a platform for you because I know you go around and you speak, and you. I also see you do some personal coaching. T- talk to us about TheoFlurry14.com. Well, it basically all started in 2009 when I launched Playing With Fire, and uh, I really had no idea what I was getting myself <laughs> by telling my story, but I quickly realized that I definitely wasn't alone and that this was something big. This was something that needed a voice. This was something that needed education, both on a personal level, you know, on a, on a bigger level. Right. And so, yeah, that's what I've been doing is, is sort of educating myself and, and by educating myself and having all these opportunities to speak to people, you know, I was sort of able to put this, uh, this language, this illness, you know, I could make sense of it all and then be able to explain it where people could fully understand. And, uh, and yeah, so that's how Flurry 14 got started was, you know, the book came out, you know, I had a Facebook account at the time <laughs> and that quickly manifests itself into a, uh, a fan page on Facebook, a Twitter account, Instagram account. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I- and yeah, and, and, you know, I'm on the road about 200 days a year now. I do wow. 75 engagements, uh, a year and, and the subject is always the same. It's, it's trauma, addictions and mental health. You know, having had, you know, my, my own personal struggles and, and having gone through what I've gone through is that I, you know, we have a saying, helping is healing. Right. More. In the last seven years that I put myself in a position of helping people, what I've done is, is I've healed myself through that process. It's- yeah. That's what I find too, Theo, for doing this podcast. I, I tell everybody it's, it's hard to do it because it's hard to talk about it. And, uh, but by doing it and pushing myself through it every time, I come out better on the other end. Yeah. I find, and it's easier to do and trying to bring everybody with me. And it is though, it's kind of cathartic. To go through it. Yeah, helping is healing and healing is possible. For the people that are going to listen to this podcast that are still struggling, what I say is, you know, don't don't quit before the miracle. Ha, huh, that's fantastic. Yeah, it's cool. Because I remember those days uh, very well where there was no solutions, there was no answers, there was nothing. All I had was a willingness and I had a little bit of hope left. And... So I tried to build every single day uh, something positive, right? uh, which meant if I was depressed is get your ass off the couch and do something. You know, I, 
I love to play golf and golf was yeah. uh, a huge part of helping me get through, you know, some dark times in my life and depression and all those things and, and, uh, or find that friend and call him and say, Hey, I'm sitting on my couch and I'm, I'm not doing well. Can you come and grab me and let's go do something? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's really important to have yeah. those friends that you can confide in. And I realized that that is the hardest thing to do is to pick up the phone and ask for help. But I think it's probably the most courageous thing that you can do is to ask for help. Asking yeah. for help doesn't mean you're weak. Ask, asking for help means you you have courage. It's the strongest thing you can do. It's a show of strength. Yeah. It's not a show of weakness. Exactly. Part of the stigma that we're talking about is that, is that people think that by asking for help, by reaching out for help means that you're weak. Well, no, it means the opposite. Yeah, totally true. Uh, Theo, you mentioned you're all over social media, so I'm going to test you now. How can we contact? What's all your social media contacts? Hey, well, we've got a bunch of things on the go. Um, uh, obviously, you know, we have Theo Fleury 14. Uh, we have conversation with a rattlesnake.com. We have a foundation called the Breaking Free Foundation. Oh, cool. All right. Where people can write to us for therapy grants. Oh, wow. Okay. Perfect. You're approved. We will hook you up with a therapist and we'll pay for your first six sessions of professional therapy. Nice. Yes. Uh, what else? Uh, we do, we do like, we do chats on Twitter, uh, once a month. Right. Uh, we blog all the time about different subjects. So is, is your Twitter Theoflurry14? Is that what? Theoflurry14 is my Twitter account. Instagram, where are you on that? Theo Fleury 14. Oh, perfect, okay. Conversations with a rattlesnake is CWAR, at CWAR, underscore on Twitter, on Facebook, Breaking Freeze on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and, and all of that, so. Excellent. Well, after this is done, when this episode goes up, I'm going to put all those, I'll have all these links for my listeners on my website so that they can just click on them and they can go to them. And, yeah. Uh, under guest info, so I'll make sure I list those for everybody listening. And uh, Theo, I can't thank you enough for coming on, and you're fantastic, and it, it was awesome talking to you. And I wish you all the best. And if there's any ever ever any way that we can help out, please reach out and let us know. It was just it was a pleasure, man. Totally yeah. a pleasure. Thank you so much. And and uh, my whole sort of education, life education, is built around team. What I'm trying to do here is create the greatest team that's ever been assembled in the history of mankind, and that's the trauma, addictions, and mental health team. And we have all these avenues. We have all these places where people can join our team. And, you know, this summer, uh, we're walking from my hometown in Russell, Manitoba, to Winnipeg in July, wow. uh, called the Victor Walk. We, it's 400 miles. We're going to do 400 miles in five days. And uh, what we do is we pick a province every year and we walk across that province to, you know, raise awareness and try to get rid of the stigma attached to sexual abuse, uh, sexual violence, rape, mental health, addictions, you know, all of these things. And so uh, you can go to the victorwalk.com website to to figure out how to join the team and, and you can create a walk in, in your town or city uh all across this great country. Cool. That is very cool, sir. And again, uh, thank you very much. Maybe, I hope maybe I can have you on the podcast again. Maybe <laughs> maybe after that walk. That would be awesome. Sure. And, uh, or if you ever have anything you want to talk about, please reach out, and uh, I'll drop everything and make some time. But uh, thank you very much again for coming on, Theo. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks. For, uh, thanks. For, and keep up the great work, and uh, you, know, you, you have my support as well. Thanks. Pleasure's all mine. Take care, bud. Well, folks, that's another episode of the podcast finished. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed doing it. Please reach out and let me know what you thought. On a similar note, whatever medium you use to listen to this podcast, whether it be YouTube or SoundCloud or maybe it's iTunes or Podcast Republic or any other podcast app that you may have, please take a second and rate the podcast and leave a review if you could. 
it really makes a huge difference on getting the podcast noticed. So I would ask your help in, uh, in doing that and just taking a few extra seconds and making sure you do that. And also always, uh, looking for feedback. So get a hold of me on Facebook, if you like, or on Twitter or an email at uptalkpodcast at gmail.com for all my links. As I mentioned earlier, at the beginning of the podcast, and you can now get all my links to contact me directly. And there's actually a spot to contact me directly on the new website, uptalkpodcast.com. Please check it out. That'll be the only site that you need uh, for everything Uptalk. Again, thanks to my sponsors, Rest Dead Seminars, Compass Rose Health and Wellness Center, and Dan Sun Photography. You'll be getting another episode almost right away in a few days. In this episode, I talked to the Nova Scotia Minister of Labor and Special Education, the Honorable Kelly Regan. I also talked to the Nova Scotia Minister of Health, the Honorable Leo Glavine, about PTSD and first responders. Really interesting chats. I hope you check that out. And Dr. Robin McGee will be back teaching us about cognitive behavior modification therapy. So it should be a good episode. And you'll get that, uh, like I said, on the 17th very soon. We'll talk to you then. Until then, as always, be safe and take care of each other. Because we ain't superheroes. We're just ordinary people trying to make a difference. And the first on every scene. And it's a heavy, heavy. Sirens are gone